Hi there, ladies and gentlemen. We are so glad you're here. I'm Alison K. Williams. I'm a writer and editor based here in Dubai, and I am so excited today to be talking to Jenny Lawson. Jenny Lawson is an award-winning humorist known for her great candor on sharing her struggles with mental illness. She lives in Texas with her husband and daughter and was constantly buying too many books, which she insists is not a real thing. So finally, she opened an actual book bookstore. She is the author of Let's Pretend This Never Happened, Furiously Happy, and You Are Here, all of which were New York Times bestsellers. We're here today to talk about Jenny's writing, Jenny's brain, and her brand new book, Broken in the Best Possible Way. Let's welcome Jenny Lawson. Oh. So Jenny, you are in San Antonio, Texas. It is 4 a.m. there. Did you get up or are you still up? Uh, you know, I was planning, I have chronic insomnia, so I thought this will be, this will be fine. Um, and, and I also thought it was really nice because I was like, okay, so at 3 a.m., if I'm still awake at 3 a.m., I can be drinking cocktails and it'll be fine. Um, but then I accidentally fell asleep, and so I had to wake up at 3 a.m., and now it feels wrong to drink a cocktail, even though it's the same time. Um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm surprisingly sober because I did fall asleep. <laughs> you write a lot about your childhood, which, you know, for all of us kind of shapes us. Your childhood involved a lot of taxidermy. And I have this vision of you as like a child Snow White, except that all of the animals flitting around and perching on your shoulders are dead and stuffed. What was it like growing up in a house full of taxidermy? You know, you know, it's one of those things where, um, because I don't have anything to compare it to, um, it's, it's hard to know that that wasn't a normal thing. Um, but yeah, my dad's a, a professional taxidermist, still is a professional taxidermist. And um, so yeah, it was, it was constant, a lot of dead deer, a lot of, lot of dead everything, just sort of sprawled out on the, the living room table before my mom finally said, get to the garage. We don't need this on the table. Um, and, uh, but there were also a ton of live animals um, because he's also, you know, friends with like conservators and like park rangers. And so when they would find animals that had been abandoned, they would be like, oh, you know who wants a bucket of raccoons? This guy, this guy would love a bucket of raccoons. And he would like, you know, raise them and, and you know, put them back in the wild and all of that. Um, but it, yeah, it was real interesting. I was, I was always like, okay, so these raccoons are our friends, but these raccoons we're gonna kill and eat. And he's like, we're not gonna eat them. We eat squirrels. Nobody eats raccoons. I'm like, well, that I don't know what the difference is that I don't wanna eat either one of them, um, but can we just play with all of them? And uh, we did, which was kind of nice because I, you know, I, I got to grow up with, you know, these raccoons that lived in our house and you know deer that would you know come inside and we'd you know dress them up and and my mom would make little like little tiny jams for them because it was the 80s and yeah it was uh it was ridiculous you know what was funny is when I wrote my first book um I I was like okay there's so many of these stories that I can't tell because no one will ever believe them and uh I um my parents were just like, oh, we have pictures of all of that. Oh, you need pictures of the raccoons that are wearing shorts running around the house. Oh, you need pictures of your, you know, dad's championship armadillo racing ring. Yeah, of course we have, you know. And so all of a sudden I was like, oh, yes, I have a book now. <laughs> And some of your book came out of your extremely popular blog, The Blog S, um, which I have been following since the days of Beyonce the Giant Metal Chicken knocking on your door. If you have not seen uh, Jenny's stories about this eight-foot metal chicken that she purchased because, I mean, how could you not? And uh, <laughs> put it outside her door to surprise her husband with. He was very surprised. Um, how did you get started blogging and what led to your turn from happy mommy blogger to woman full of radical honesty? <laughs> 
So I, I have always written um, because I have really severe, I'm very, very introverted um, and I have really severe social anxiety disorder. And so especially before I was diagnosed and was able to get therapy and medication, um, the only good way that I had to communicate with people is by writing because talking to people was just so terrifying. Um, so I was reading this, um, this blog was, that was on the Houston Chronicle and um, the woman who was writing it uh, basically said something like, you know, I have to stop doing this because, you know, I'm not, I don't think that you can be maybe a blogger and a, and a good mother at the same time. So I'm not going to do this anymore. And I, uh, re I reached out to the editor and I was like, well, I, I, I apparently am a bad mother because I would love to do that. I would love to, and I'll do it for free. And I, I think it was the, and I'll do it for free that made him go, you're hired, except, you know, in a way that they won't ever pay me. Um, and so I would write these, these just, you know, funny sort of things about what it was like to be a mom. And I was always right on that line of what you can and can't say. And uh, over and over, they were like, you can't really say this. And, yeah. and so I finally was like, I'm just going to start my own blog where I can write exactly what I want to write. And my, my actually, my first post was just the F word, just enormously, um, just to get it out of the way. And it was, uh, yeah, I just thought, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll have three readers. Um, and one of those readers was the girl that worked in the cubicle next to me. And I would like look over the cubicle and I would go, Christine, would you leave a comment on my blog? And she'd be like, yeah, I think it's kind of offensive, but okay, yeah, okay. And, um, but I was able to, you know, to, to find my voice in that I um, would talk about uh, things that were, um, that, that I thought were funny or I thought were interesting or I thought were um, things that I couldn't not talk about. And suddenly instead of people going, oh, you're a weirdo, I wanna run away. They were like, oh my God, me too. Me too, I also wondered why Jesus wasn't considered a zombie since he came back from the dead. And, um, and yeah, it was nice. You are so honest in your work. It's been an inspiration for me. It's been an inspiration for millions of writers, millions of human beings. And I was teaching a memoir class yesterday morning here at the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature. And one of the big fears people often have when they first start telling their story is, how much can I talk about my family? And you talk about your husband, Victor, a lot. You talk about your daughter, Haley, a lot. Where's the line for you? Like, do you consult with them about what you're going to write? How does how does that work? Um, you know, I think I think it's different for every person. Um, for me, anytime that I ever write about anyone, they get to read the uh, all the chapters first. So they get it first. And my thing is, you can at any point say, "I don't want you to write about this," and no questions asked. I'll, I'll pull it. Um, and what I have found is not only are, are people very much less likely to say, no, I don't want you to, but they're more likely to say, yeah, that's, that's a fine chapter, but you forgot this part or you forgot this part. And so actually they're the ones who are more likely to bring up additional stuff. Um, there are, you know, there's, I definitely have boundaries, especially when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, my kid, um, very often, especially like when they were in their, you know, middle school ages. And I, I was like, oh, this is such a funny story. And they were just like, this is not a funny story. This is embarrassing. And, and I was like, this is, it's going to be so fun. When you turn 18, you're going to think this is hilarious. But middle school, Haley was not okay with it. So, you know, I just kind of accepted that. And I was like, I can always write about it later. Um, but, it, but it is interesting um, you know, it's always, it's always a slice of life of kind of where your life is at. And one of the things that, um, that I've, uh, you know, um, an experience that I've been going through recently is about maybe less than a year ago, um, Haley uh, came out as non-binary and they changed their, uh, their adjectives to they, them. And um, the book I had written when, you know, before when we were still using uh, she, her pronouns. And 
So now when I look at the book, I'm like, oh, this is weird. This is, you know, because I, I finally have gotten used to the pronouns, which are so hard to get used to. And then finally I'm like, oh no, okay, I get it. Um, but what's, what's really nice is that um, I, I'm writing like an extra chapter for uh, the bonus, the, the, like a bonus chapter that'll come out whenever the, the paperback comes out. And um, the, my editor was like, you know, if you want, we could, because it didn't match because I was using they, them and instead of she, her. On, and, and my editor was like, well, we could change all the pro pronouns in the, you know, the new book. And I was like, that is fantastic. And, you know, Haley was happy. And so it's, it's really just a matter of finding, you know, that perfect mix of, um, because it's not going to be a funny story for me if, if I'm sharing something that makes somebody else uncomfortable. And it's, you know, it, it depends. I'm not judging anybody who's like, because it's your story, you're allowed to write whatever you want to write. But for me personally, what it always goes back to is the joke has to be on me. You know, there's never a time when somebody else is the punchline more than myself. Absolutely. And, and I think the more honest you are, and you are extremely honest about your own vulnerabilities, about your own failings, the more likely the reader is to take you seriously when you show someone else's behavior. And then the reader gets to judge them for themselves, which I think is, is marvelous. You know, we get to look at the people you're talking to. And even there's a beautiful section in Broken. And um, I'm, you know, I live here in Dubai, but I'm an American. So I'm really familiar with the feeling of like calling up the doctor and asking, do you give a discount for cash? You know, can you, can you let your intern see me? And will it cost less if the intern see sees me, you know, and so I've always associated being ill with humiliation, like not just discomfort, but being humiliated. And here in Broken, you write an open letter to my insurance company, and you're still not blaming them. You're still, you're describing everything they do and letting us blame them. How did you get to a point where you were able to move through the difficulties you were experiencing and write something that coherent and important while still struggling with the problems that your insurance company refused to treat? Uh, you know, it was, it was really a long process. That chapter came about over um, about a year of having to deal with, you know, not only because I have treatment resistant depression, um, I do a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say experimental, but sort of unique treatments of transcranial magnetic stimulation or um, ketamine treatment or, you know, different things like that. And so it was a constant fight to try to get them to not even to cover it, but just to like, can you count it toward my deductible? Can you at least say, yes, this is medical? Um, and, and it was not only that, but it was also even covering my antidepressants, you know, which are $300 a month. And, um, you know, it's just this insane process of, of me going like, you don't want me off antidepressants. This will cost you more in the long run. This, what you don't want me in the hospital. This, you know, like you really should cover at least a little bit of it. Um, and, and so, yeah, writing that chapter of just an open letter of this is what I have had to go through. And, and here's the thing is, I am incredibly lucky and privileged. You know, I have money to, you know, pay for insurance. I have like one of the best premiums that you can possibly get. I have money, you know, to take care of myself when I can't get covered. I work from home. So I have time that I can spend on the phone, you know, four or five hours at a time on the insurance where well, tons of people can't do that. What they want is they want you to give up and go, oh, forget it. I'll just pay for it myself. Um, and I was so frustrated with it um, that I, I ended up working on this thing and finally um, put it together during a moment of sheer desperation and submitted it. Actually, I sent, I sent it to my insurance company and they were just like wow that's really embarrassing we're still not gonna really cover your stuff but um yeah that sucks sorry wow 
Well, I think you really adequately expressed the, I mean, beautifully expressed the frustration of so many Americans wrestling with the whole health insurance issue. Um, here in Dubai, we're really lucky. Just about everybody has very good health insurance. And it's like this special Sunday treat where I'm like, oh, I don't feel good. I'm going to go to the doctor. It's awesome. Uh, you know, it's like I, I get to go. I cannot even imagine it. I cannot. That really was a big part of why I wrote that is because I think there are so many people who who go through the process of being denied, and then you have to go through the review process, then you have to go through the appeal process, then you have to go to the board process, then you have to, I mean, there's like a six step process for every medication, every different thing. And um, what I wanted was for, would people read it for them to go, oh, this isn't me, this isn't, because, and especially if you're dealing with, you know, um, depression, you're so exhausted, you're already in your head, you're already going, I'm not worth this, you know, extra time and this extra money. Um, and so I wanted for people to read this and go, oh, I'm not the only one dealing with it. Everybody should be able to get basic health care. Everybody should be able to be safe in their body. And yeah, just to say, you're not alone. It's okay. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to ask for someone else to call for you, if you can't handle it, if you feel like you know you're too tired to fight for your own medical help, it's it's okay to reach out and say, "I need help." Um, and that's so hard, especially when you're sick, and especially like a mental illness sickness, because it feels so much in your head, like maybe this isn't real, maybe this, maybe I'm just lazy, maybe I'm just. And it isn't until you come out of a depression that you're like, oh, no, I was actually really sick. Like I could have died from that. That actually is, is really a serious, important thing, even though my brain was lying to me and saying, you know, it's all in your head. And of course it's in my head because it's my brain. But guess what? That's where all my best stuff is, right up here. So, yeah. So this kind of ongoing struggle where it's really hard to control your results has a parallel to another process that you are engaged in all the time, which is writing. And I heard you once describe a typical writing day for you as I wrote a paragraph, but then I deleted it. What's your writing yeah. process like? It is, um, it's extremely slow. I'm always so jealous of um, the people who are so prolific and they're like, you know, they get on a plane and by the time they land, they're like, I wrote a new novel. Um, my stuff took my first book, um, which was an overnight success because it was, you know, like number one on the New York Times bestseller list the day that it, uh, the day that it came out. Um, it took me 11 years to write that. Uh, and then after it came out, um, I had you know, the people were like, oh, I can't wait for your next one. And I was like, I have to write a next one? Um, <laughs> that seems terrifying. And um, it, that one took me years and years. And I am always perpetually years behind on deadline. Some of that is because um, depression just naturally kind of slows me down. Some of it is because I also have ADD, which makes me just woohoo all over the place. Um, and I also have a really bad case of imposter syndrome. So I am constantly looking at my stuff and going, this is awful. No one will ever like you. No one thinks this is funny, but you. Um, so yeah, I've had, I've had to find a, a lot of different tools for what works for me. And, um, and, it, and it's always interesting because different people have different ideas. And so um, I'm really lucky I have a lot of... Uh, great friends who are also writers who were like, you try this to try this. And um, Neil Gaiman famously is like, writer's block doesn't exist. Just sit down and write. And I was like, it does exist. I love you, Neil, but it totally exists for me. Um, some of the things that, that I found that really helped me are, um, first of all, if you have ADD, um, there's this thing called pink noise. I don't know what it is, but if you go on YouTube, you can find it. And it just, it kind of sounds like the ocean, but not really, but it, it helps to um, kind of take your head off of the, like when you have ADD, you can hear the lights. 
um, which seems ridiculous, but if you have ADD and you're in a room with fluorescent lights, you're probably like, ah, stop talking lights. Um, so that was one of them. One of the other things that, um, that I learned to do is I would take my, um, I, I have sort of a, a pin board up, which is just my wall and it's filled with uh, post-it notes. And each of the post-it notes just has like, this is kind of what I think this chapter is gonna be about. And every single time when I would finish writing for the day, um, I each one of those little post-it notes says like, this is the percentage that I have finished. And usually it's like, you know, this one's 15% finished or this one's. And so every day at the end of the day, I would pull it down and be like, okay, well, I just wrote like a paragraph. So I guess now it's 16% finished. Um, but there's something about seeing it constantly move up a little and a little and a little that makes it easier and makes it feel like more bite-sized. So those are some of the things. And then also I've just learned to like not compare myself to other people, that it's okay that it takes me five years in between each book. I mean, maybe if I came out with something every year, people would be like, oh, her again? I, I'm, you know, but with every five years, you're like, oh, she's still alive? Awesome. <laughs> I love that. And, um, you know, you're already, you're doing great. Donna Tart takes 10. So you're already ahead of her, twice as fast. Your, <laughs> your first book, Let's Pretend This Never Happened, I think of as being very funny, very quirky, um, very nostalgic, you know, weaving together your childhood, your adulthood. Your second book, Furiously Happy, feels much more like an exhortation to the reader. You know, come with me, we are going to be happy, we are going to decide that we are going to be happy. And your third book, Broken, has a lot more seriousness in it. You get a lot more specific about sadness, about feeling like you're navigating through the dark and then you're not navigating at all. What led you through that evolution to where this was the book that you needed to write now? Um, you know, I think it had a lot to do with what was happening in that time period. Um, I had, um, you know, I've, I've always struggled with depression and anxiety and, and all of that, but my depression got really low um, about five years ago. And I've had these really deep, deep dives. And one of the things that I found was that um, in looking through, I was doing, you know, some sort of like ancestry digging. And I found that my um, great grandmother had, uh, who I had no idea anything about, um, but she had died in a mental institution in the town where I grew up and nobody ever talked about it. And this particular, I, I did some research on this particular um, institution and they did, you know, they did insulin therapy where they would, you know, put you in diabetic comas and they did uh, hydrotherapy where they would put you in freezing cold baths and they did just, a, just you know, some really horrific stuff. And um, unsurprisingly, uh, she died in, the, in the, the, the institution, which a lot of people did from, um, from the treatments themselves. And uh, I just thought, I am so lucky to be able to live in a time where I can talk about this. Number one, I can get help for it, number two, and um, and number three, that there are so many options out there that that didn't exist back in her time, and so I really thought I'm going to go on a, a real journey of what can I do to take myself out of these incredibly deep depressions where you know it would be a week of me I can't get out of bed and I can't you know focus I can't do anything, and. Um, so, you know, when I started writing the book, I thought, this may not be a book. This may just be something I just write for myself. Um, and that's, that's sort of how I do every single book. Every book that I write, I think I'm writing this for my possible future grandkids, you know, that they'll pull it out of the sock drawer and say, oh, this is what their life was like. Um, and so that's sort of what I was doing with this, because I did think I was like, there's a lot of really dark stuff in here, even though I still think it is still a comedy book. It's still, you know, won awards for comedy and humor, but I definitely put a lot of, um, 
of my struggle in there. And I, I was very afraid that people would say, oh no, this is too much. Like, like we're okay with regular crazy, but you're like over the top crazy. Um, but what I found is that people are willing to come with you. You know, they're willing to come with you um, either because they look and go, oh my gosh, oh, me too. Me too. I thought, I thought it was just me or because they're just like, well, this is a train wreck. Um, or because they look at it and go, at least I'm not this bad. And I'm okay with that. I am great for being the like signpost of like, here there be dragons, stay away, <laughs> you know, don't let it get this far. Um, so yeah. I love that. And I love that you talk about that shock of recognition in the reader as well. I mean, I think one of the great gifts of memoir, of nonfiction writing, of your writing in particular, is that the reader goes, oh, I'm not the only one who felt that way. And I think one of your great powers as a writer and as a person in the world is that you have taken this parasocial community, you know, apparently what we're calling each other nowadays when we know people on the internet and we feel like we know them, but we don't technically really and parasocial, but you uh -huh. have taken parasocial relationships with your readers and you have turned them into a genuine, real community of people who actually know each other and whose parasocial relationships are genuinely helping them. How did that happen? Um, you know, it, it was very organic. I feel so incredibly lucky that, you know, t I think generally on the internet, the rule of like, don't read the comments holds true. It does not though hold true with my people, um, which I think is so amazing. Um, I think a lot of it is because people feel comfortable um, talking. They know that they're not going to, to be judged. Um, I think um, a lot of it is because it, it's not unusual for me at three o'clock in the morning, I'm, you know, spiraling kind of out of control and I'm having a panic attack and I don't want to wake anybody up, but I really, I just, I feel so like alone and I will reach out on Twitter and be like, things aren't good for me. Like, can some, can somebody tell me it's going to be okay? And, and I, and there are, you know, hundreds of people at three o'clock in the morning going, I am sitting here and having the same, you know, the same thought in my head. And you know what, I'm going to sit with you in this. Um, and that's really wonderful. You know, one of the, one of the first times that that happened was when, um, the first time that I ever wrote about how really bad my depression and anxiety was, um, on my blog and I thought this will be the post where people go, oh, this isn't all just funny. This is, yeah, this is too much for me. Um, but I felt like I was creating this false history because um, I was writing these, I would write these funny things and I would keep them because I knew um, that there would be these periods of time where I couldn't do anything at all. And so I would publish these and I would see the comments come in and I would be like, that's so funny. That's so, and it felt such, if there was this cognitive dissonance of like, yes, but really I'm laying here on the couch feeling like the worst mom and wife. And this is so messed up. Um, so, but when I wrote the, the post, um, not only were people, you know, thousands of people, you know, reached out and just anonymously left this comment of, oh my God, me too. I feel like my life is, is worthless sometimes. And my brain also lies to me. And um, what was really interesting about that is that there were all of these people who um, reached out afterward, who were actively in the process of planning their suicide but who instead decided to get help, but not because of what I wrote, but because they saw thousands of anonymous comments of people saying, oh, me too, me too. I also think that I'm not worthwhile, that, that the world would be better off without me. And they read those comments and they were like, that can't possibly be true, that, that, that the world would be better off without them. And they thought, well, if, if that's not true for them, then Maybe that's not true for me either. Maybe I deserve also to, to get help. And um, I, I think what's really amazing is that there are all of these, there are these people out there in the world who left these anonymous comments just saying, yeah, I hurt too. 
and they have no idea that they saved people's lives, that there are, you know, mothers and fathers and daughters and, you know, siblings and who were alive today because a stranger reached out and said, me too. And I love that your own honesty and openness created a space where people felt like they could say that, like they could admit it. And I think that's one of the great things about interacting through a screen these days is that there is a power and anonymity as well, where we can be genuine about what we're feeling and receive genuine help and support while not having to out who exactly we are. And I think that's so powerful. Will exactly. you read us a section of your book and do you have it handy or do you do you need a moment i i have it and actually this is um this is the perfect seg because um the uh the chapter that i'm going to read is a chapter that is about community um and it felt like i was cheating when i wrote this chapter so what happened was um i wrote this really embarrassing thing that happened to me and other people started sharing it and um, in the process of sharing it, it became this enormous thing where thousands and thousands of people were sharing the most embarrassing thing that had ever happened to them. Um, and it was so funny and so perfect and made me feel so happy. And I thought, I am, I'm going to write a whole chapter about mortification and how wonderful it is to share that mortification. And I, I was like, I need to reach out first to make sure that um, that all of these people that I'm going to quote are okay with me sharing it and being credited in the book. And I thought that I probably maybe half of them would say yes. And instead, every single person said absolutely. And what they said was after sharing that horribly embarrassing moment that they had like uh, never shared before, they all of a sudden now think of that as such a great story and that they had made friends on the internet because other people had said, oh my gosh, that's such a funny story. Let's be friends. And um, so that is the story. Uh, and I, I, am gonna, I, mean, I am gonna cut it down um, quite a bit because it's a little bit long. Uh, so if you read the, the real chapter, it's actually about twice as long. Also, um, the people who actually left these tweets they're credited, but I'm not gonna read their names. Um, but when you get the book, you can read it just cause it, it kind of messes with the flow a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> Awkwarding brings us together. Not long ago, I sent a small tweet out into the universe. Airport cashier, have a safe flight, me. You too, I can never come back here again. It was a tiny glimpse into the awkwardness of being me, but it set off a tsunami of responses that I still have not entirely recovered from. Shockingly, it was not from people telling me how stupid I am, but from people sharing how stupid they are. Uh, and here we started. This is uh, interspersed with their quotes, back to me talking. Uh, once high-fived a retail staffer who was helping me, turns out she was waving to a friend outside the store, still not over it. I texted my boss at the end of my first day on my new job with heading out, love you, intended for my boyfriend. An elderly man presented his discount card to me and I said, you're getting ready to expire. I could not recover. I talked fast and once told a customer at a bookstore that a new novel had made the man liquor bong list. I meant the man booker long list. I had a cashier extend his hand slightly sideways and I shook it. He was asking for my coupons. <laughs> a friend's grandmother avoids funerals because instead of regrets, she gets nervous and congratulates the family. I once loudly proclaimed at work, that's how the dildos went extinct. Dodos. It was the dodos. A friend thanks me for coming to her husband's funeral. My reply, anytime. Thousands of people sent me these confessions of mortifying encounters that they had had with friends or family or total strangers. And then thousands of people read those stories and shared the horrifying, embarrassing things that they had been carrying around all their lives. And it was glorious. I recently answered a coworker's how are you with a weird Chewbacca-like groan and was too embarrassed to fix it. Uh, the cashier said hi to me and I said artichokes because that's what she was holding. My coworker asked what I was eating for lunch. I told her placenta. I meant polenta. 
uh, sent a female coworker an email attachment with here you ho instead of here you go. I did it twice. I accidentally texted my boss a sound clip of me flushing the toilet. At a funeral, I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that your father was sick. My friend says, thanks. I said, was it serious? She said, yes, you're at his funeral. <laughs> Went to a mass, the guy in front of me turned and said, peace be with you. And I said, pleased to meet you and shook his hand. <laughs> The more stories that came in, the more I could relate to them. And I wasn't alone. People laughed and cringed along with the confessions until they found the ones that resonated with them and responded with, oh my God, I did that once too. And let me tell you how it was even worse. Uh, a friend went and placed her order at the drive-thru. She heard, could you pull up to the speaker? You're talking to the trash can. Uh, my mom told people that I loved my silver bullet, which is a lady pleaser. She got the name wrong. It is the magic bullet blender. Uh, pulled out a panty liner instead of a $5 bill to pay for my lunch. Once in a public bathroom with my sister. While on the toilet, I reached under the stall divider to grab her ankle and scare her. It was not her. <laughs> and these strangers shared these mortifying stories that had, had uh, haunted them during sleepless nights at 3 a.m. They suddenly felt celebrated rather than ashamed as their unique and ridiculous tales brought people around the world laughter. The terrible details only made the stories more human and perfect. Uh, pulled into a gas station, was on the wrong side of the pump for the gas cap, drove around to the other side, did it again, just drove away. Working at a hardware store, I picked up the intercom phone, forgot what I was doing, and loudly said, hello, to the entire store. <laughs> First date, I had never eaten pistachios before. I crunched into a handful, shell and all, just pretended that's how I preferred them. <laughs> and as the stories continued to flood in, I watched people slowly realizing that no one wants to celebrate the size of your... Yacht, hair, waist, manhood, what really brought the world together was dropping the pretense that everything is shiny and perfect so that for a moment we could all accept how wonderfully human we are. I frequently wait for stop, stop signs to turn green. Uh, was giving someone a Brazilian wax and inadvertently glued my bangly bracelet to her lady garden. <laughs> Chatting with a new neighbor, spider crawls into my bikini top. I scream, get it off and rip off my top, flashing six people. Surviving mortification makes you stronger and more resilient because you have no other choice but to move on. Either you can let it eat at you or you can celebrate it and bring joy to someone else who will cringe and giggle like mad along with you. Accidentally making things awkward is such a familiar, vulnerable, and understated accomplishment warned coworker about a creepy man who was lurking in the parking lot. It was her husband. Had a bagger help, uh, oh wait, oh sorry, let's skip that one. Uh, husband discreetly spit gristle into a napkin. Waiter pick, picks up the napkin with a flourish, gristle takes flight, lands on the table behind us. Bought a new dress for my grandma's funeral, arrived. My cousins were shocked and laughing. Turns out grandma has on the same dress. Uh, first gynecological appointment with my mom's doctor. During an exam, he said that I looked like my mom. I asked if that was common. He meant my face. <laughs> Days after I wrote my initial tweet, the responses were still rolling in, and it got so much attention that the New York Times wrote an entire article about it. Socialites and millionaires spend their entire lives trying to get mentioned in the Times, and it turns out what really appeals to people are true stories of screwing up in incredibly human ways. And to this day, I cannot read these responses without cry laughing. Trying to be inconspicuous, I hid a tampon in my sleeve and headed to the bathroom, waved hi to someone, it flew across the floor, just kept walking. Farted very loudly with a coworker right outside my office, picked up my cell phone and pretended it was my dad and that farts were just his ringtone. Uh, when Stacy's mom's song first came out, I asked a friend's roommate, Stacy, if her mom had it going on. She had recently died, so no. <laughs> Paid cash in Starbucks, the employee extends his fist, so I gave him a fist bump. Turns out he was holding out my change. And this <laughs> is what humanity is made of, not of saving orphaned otters from fires or flashy Instagram celebrities. It is made of unexpected farts and acute awkwardness and mortifying accidents and horrifying autocorrects. It is made of the very things that only humans can truly pull off. And it is amazing. 
uh, the girl in the stall next to me kept talking to me. So I kept chatting, heard her say, someone keeps talking to me. She was on the phone. Uh, tasting beers at a brewery, I poured the ones that I didn't like into a bucket, like in a wine tasting. It was their tip jar. Sent a corporate email apologizing for the incontinence instead of inconvenience. Also, I signed it Satan instead of Sarah. Paid uh, past bad gas alone in a copy, were, uh, copy room at work, and then my coworker walked in. So I blamed the terrible smell on the radiator. It smelled so bad, my coworker called maintenance. Uh, waiting while my husband was using a porta potty, two city workers picked it up and start walking away. I'm too shocked to say he's still inside. Here is what I have learned. Whenever something truly mortifying happens, you have a choice. You can let it haunt you for the rest of your life or you can celebrate it. As today's awkward moment is tomorrow's fantastic story. Your mortifying story will invite other people's story into their world and your world. And then suddenly there are so many of us sharing horrifying confessions that the people who didn't have awkward moments are suddenly the awkward ones. And we, for once, the artless misfits can feel a little sorry for them as they will never join this strange community and know our secret handshake. At a dad, at my dad's, at a friend's dad's funeral, I asked how her mom was, forgetting that I had been to that funeral six months before. Her response, still dead. Waved at a guy in a garden wearing sunglasses and a hat many times in passing over a weekend with no response. It was a scarecrow. In line at a grocery store, I said, tell them, tell the nice man goodbye. And I looked down realizing I didn't bring my kids to the store. Uh, I asked the pharmacist if I could get some euthanasia for a head cold that wouldn't go away. She said that seems drastic. I meant <laughs> echinacea. Presented myself saying, hi, I'm Ramona. The other person said, oh my God, we have the same name. My answer was awesome. What's your name? <laughs> I once tried to remove a stray hair from the collar of a cute guy sitting in front of me. Turns out it was attached to his ear. So the next time you do something incredibly embarrassing, please remind yourself that you are being the most human you can possibly be and you're giving witnesses permission to forgive themselves for all the future embarrassments that lie in store for them. I thank you for it. And in fact, next time you do something mortifying, you can tell everyone you did it for me. And technically that means it's my fault. Everyone wins. On the phone to my boyfriend on the, on the train, I panic and said, oh my God, I have to go. I can't find my phone. He said, how are we talking? <laughs> Gave the waiter what I thought was a Groupon and got happy when he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we don't take these. Turns out it was a recipe for turkey casserole. I called my husband in a panic because I saw a van like ours in an accident. He said, you're driving the car. Responding to a text message to my boss, I tried to write, thanks so much, but after not typing it perfectly, it auto-corrected to, thanks, douche. <laughs> uh, I thought I was applying chapstick to my pocket. I just put a tampon to my mouth in front of an entire car sale show of people. If you have managed to read these wonderful confessions without doing that thing where you were giggling so much um, that people are staring at you and you're trying to explain what's so funny, but you're cry laughing so hard you can't get it out and they just sort of stare at you like you're insane and that somehow makes it worse so you laugh harder and then you get mad that they aren't appreciating how fantastically wonderful it all is, then I'm sorry, we can't be friends. And honestly, I'm a little embarrassed for you. I really love that chapter, and I was, in fact, cry laughing in the green room prior to this, loudly enough that people did walk over to me to find out what was going on. Um, we're going to take some questions now for Jenny. So if you have a question, please feel free to uh, come on up to one of the microphones. And uh, while you sort through your question and come on up, Jenny, I'll just tell you that this morning as I parked at the hotel, um, I very carefully eased my car in between a pillar and a big Dubai-style Rolls Royce. And when I got in, I realized I was probably going to hit the rolls with my car door if I tried to get out of the car. It was just so tight and there was a big pillar on the other side. So I rolled down my window and I was halfway out the window when a young man in a uniform came up and said, Madam, we have valet. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love, I have climbed out of the moonroof of my car on many occasions. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I totally get it. And I think it's fine. I think it's, you know, it's, it's like a door. 
but it's a door you just need <laughs> for, you know, and you get to slide down the hood. I think it's fantastic. My husband says that I will eventually break the glass and that's going to be a bad day, but um, I think it's fine. It's a nice slide. Who has a question they'd like to ask? Hi, Jenny. Does that sound okay or am I echoing? Yeah, you're great. Cool. <laughs> um, first, I wanted to say that, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so first I wanted to say that um, as a writer who also has ADD, I find you very inspiring because it makes me think that it's possible to have ADD and maybe finish my book one day. Um, and I wanted to ask um, how you cope when you feel like your brain is kind of like the source of, you know, all your creativity, but it also feels like it's your enemy sometimes and kind of standing in your way. So like, how do you kind of show yourself compassion when that happens and not beat yourself up? And how do you find your way back to your writing after those periods of time? That is such a good question. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird mixed bag when, you know, your brain is in so many ways your worst enemy when you're dealing with um, you know, ADD and depression, anxiety and all of that. Um, but what I try to remind myself is that those same things uh, give me, first of all, they give me a very unique look at the world. Um, and I think, I think it's, it's very easy if you've ever spent any time with somebody who has severe ADD and they just come up with these bizarre things and you're like, that was not what we were talking about and what is happening in your head. Um, so, so I think one of the things is going back and celebrating that even though it is such a pain, um, it can create a really a unique worldview that, that, that other people may not have. So that's the, the, one of the first things. The second thing is forgiving myself for um, the times when, when I can't write and when my brain doesn't work and when things aren't doing well. And one of the, one of the main things that I've, I'm trying to learn now is to forgive myself for thinking that that's something I need to be forgiven for because you know, we're, we're made the way that we're supposed to be made. Um, you know, I, I had um, some issues with, uh, this is gonna sound really ridiculous, but where, you know, my um, psychiatrist was like, you have got to take your ADD medication because you're, you're really not, you know, getting anything done. And it's, it causes all this anxiety because you're not getting things done. And I'm like, yeah, but the ADD medication causes anxiety because it makes me, you know, more aware. And, um, and, and I thought, you know, if I take medication for that and I take my antidepressants and I take my, you know, anti-anxiety and I take my, you know, all my stuff, is that going to dull me down to where I'm not creative anymore? I'm not unique anymore. Um, and, and what I have learned is that every single person has a great story in them. They may not have the, um, the privilege to tell it or sometimes the ability to tell it, but um, those stories are so important. And uh, so first of all, I would say, write your book because I want to read it. I, I read, like literally I read hundreds of books a year, which just comes from um, not only that I love to read and it, it's a wonderful pastime, but also because I'm a, I own a bookstore. And so I'm constantly like, I want more, give me more. So write your book because I want to read it. And it, that goes to every single person who is out there right now, who is like, I have this idea or I, you know, have this thing in my sock drawer or I have this, write it down. Even if no one ever sees it, but you, it is a wonderful thing. And if you're writing for yourself, you will never be disappointed. I know that sounds, that sounds strange, but every single time when I start to write, and, and here's another like writing tool that I use, especially I think it helps with ADD is um, at the top of the page, I will write, here's what I want you to know. Um, because very often that empty page can be so scary but if you do it, here's what you, here's what I want you to know. Then all of a sudden it's like, I want you to know that I had this thought today. And then all of a sudden it starts to, you know, to, to come around. So that's a great technique. That's wonderful. I think we have time for one more question. Is there somebody else who has a question? 
leaping to your feet, vaulting towards the stage. <laughs> yeah, come on up, Annabelle. Uh, so this is a woman named Annabelle, and she has fantastic mermaid purple hair that matches her fantastic purple pants. I feel Yay. like I feel like you've oversold me a bit, but okay. <laughs> um, my question is basically how I mean I think your readers have responded really well to everything that you write and and who you are as a person. I was just wondering how the writing community and publishing industry responded and particularly at the start when you were writing your first book? Wow, that is a really good question. So I, um, when I was first, when I first started writing the book, uh, I went to a writing conference, much like this one. And I went to this, um, this panel and it was all about how to uh, how to write a, a proposal how to get an editor how to you know do all that stuff and um and 100 was uh, something that i needed because huh, learn from me somebody actually contacted me a couple of years into blogging and was like hi i'm an editor i'd really like to talk to you about a book and because i didn't know that editors were the people who bought your book and published it. I just thought they were the ones who like said, you're not using punctuation, right? I was like, oh no, thank you. Just turned it down. Cause I was like, I can't afford to have someone correct my punctuation. People can figure it out, uh, learn from me. Um, so, so I go to this, uh, this, it, it, this, uh, this thing and, it, and it's all about like, here's how you do it. And I was so overwhelmed and terrified. And I was like, I will never do this. Um, and I was just disappointed. So I, I left in the middle of the, uh, of the panel. I went straight to the bar and started drinking and um, then went uh, after drinking for like an hour with my friends. I went to a, um, to a keynote address and uh, that I wasn't doing, but um, in, a, in a very terribly awkward way, as becomes me. Um, I mortified myself in front of thousands of people in like a really bad way, like a, like a, a way of like, I was crying for two weeks afterward and it was fine. It wasn't my fault. It was all, it was all okay, but it was absolutely mortifying. And the agent, one of the fancy New York agents that was there um, was like, who was that? And what just happened? What is going on? And all the people at the table were like, I don't know. Um, that was weird. But that's Jenny Lawson. She's really funny. And so she started reading my blog uh, and reached out and was like, I think you have a book in you. And I was like, I think I do too, but I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And I was just really lucky, um, which is like such a bad example of, you know, just Well, Jenny, lucky. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you for a quick second here because you were lucky after you had spent five or six years consistently generating content in public for free. You were lucky because yeah, you were in the right place at the right time and were prepared. Exactly, exactly. The, but you know, it, it really, it really goes back to um, because I was like, "Oh, I'm just not good enough. I'm not going to be professional enough. I'm not going to be." And it, it turns out that if you have, you know, enough background information, and if you find your voice, and you sort of find your community, and you that give yourself a chance. Even if you're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. Sometimes it's just finding the right people. Um, I mean, there were a ton of people. I still have a ton of people who don't like my work at all. And then, um, you know, especially I would say some of the more like highbrow places are, are just very like, mm, this lady says vagina a lot. And I'm like, yeah, I do. Um, but, um, but there's, but my books are always bestsellers because even if even if there's only, you know, 10% of the world who are the, you know, strange misfits who find ridiculous things funny, that adds up, you know, there's a lot of us out there. Like, yes, 90% of the world are looking at us and going, oh, what? Um, but, but we're there. And, you know, one of the things that I always go back to is um, when, my, when my first book came out. So when your book comes out, there are these, uh, these trade reviews that you wanna get. And they're, it's like, you know, Kirkus and Publishers Weekly and I think American Library Associate, I can't remember, but there's like six or seven of them where you really want um, those people to review your book. And um, I, I think I got two or three of the reviews and, and, and two of them were like, oh, this is really funny. This is oh, okay. This is honest and, 
Um, and then one was horrifically bad. Um, and not only so bad, but it was so bad that, that the reviewer used words that I had to look up because I didn't even know what some of those words were. Um, and I, it was just absolutely awful. And, and my agent was like, okay, first of all, never read reviews. That is not what you're there for. You are not here to please everyone, you know? Um, and what was really funny is, uh, and she was like, also those are done by one person, you know, like one person thought you, you know, were a flash in the pan and that you'll never write anything again, whatever. It's not a big deal. Um, but that exact same, exact same, um, reviewing publication when my uh, audiobook came out, which is the exact same book, by the way, just read by me. They were like, a tour de force. And I'm like, <laughs> it's, the, it's the same book. It's the same. And after that, I was like, I will take every criticism with a grain of salt. And also every, every like, yeah, you're amazing with a grain of salt. Like it, it all, when it comes right down to it, write for yourself, write things that you're later going to go, I'm proud of that. Even if it was embarrassing, even if it was silly, even if it was ridiculous, no matter what, as long as it's you and it's unique, because if you write something that you're like, oh, this is something that won't offend people. This is something that, you know, won't ruffle feathers. You're going to write something that people already know, like be you because nobody else can be you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. As we come to the end of the session, before you head out to get Jenny's books, which are right out there in the lobby, I want to thank you, the audience, for coming here and joining us today. Thank you so much to our wonderful AV team and our fantastic volunteers who you will see all around the festival. Thank you to our title sponsor, Emirates Airline, our founding partner, Dubai Culture, our parent organization, the Emirates Literature Foundation, and of course, the amazing industry indomitable and very beautifully broken, Jenny Lawson. Yay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for being here today. Have a great day.